The designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Um, we're going to actually try three things tonight. Um, and I apologize to anyone that doesn't like math or complexity. Originally, I had promised I was going to do something more simple tonight. And let's just say it didn't work out. So the three things we're going to try doing this evening. One, I want to spend a few minutes talking about folklore. Um, the things we get as members of Congress, and this is both for the folks on the left and the right, you know, the comments we get, people, things people believe, and I want to walk through a little bit of that. I want to do sort of an update status on what's happening financially. And then I'm going to broach a subject that's really uncomfortable, and that's going to be talking about sort of the future. Um, I'm going to talk about sort of fertility rates and, and what that means to being able to finance Social Security and other things. And for anyone that does not like math, please just go, go watch something on Netflix right now. Um, a couple weeks ago, I did a whole presentation on the work we've done on what it takes financially to save Social Security. And one of the things I've been ang I'm genuinely angry about, and I've been angry about for years, is the left uses Social Security as a weapon, and our folks are terrified to talk about it, because every time we talk about trying to save it, we get attacked. And then my brothers and sisters on the left will say, well, just raise the cap. And we showed the math. We, I mean, we had two PhD economists spend months working out the math and raising the caps doesn't get you anywhere close to stabilizing it. And the immorality of this place being willing to double senior poverty in nine years. You do understand, even if you raise the caps, I showed math that you were still having about a $400 billion shortfall in the first year. And if you did all the taxes, you might got that down to 250, 300 billion dollar shortfall. Today's math says the average couple in 2034 will take a $17,400 cut. We will double senior poverty. Is that a Republican or Democrat perversity? I'll just argue it's a moral one. Why can't we actually work on the math? Yet, when I chaired the Social Security subcommittee, every time I tried to do a room full of actuaries and those things, my brothers and sisters on the left found more joy in the politics because it's a powerful issue. And absolutely immoral what we're doing. We, there's this concept of a white, a black swan. That's something that sneaks up on you and blows you up. There's this concept of a white swan. You see it coming and you don't do anything. We have the actuary reports in front of us. I know this is a math-free zone, so one of the first things I want to walk through is a concept of, when I did the speech a couple weeks ago, it's had a couple hundred thousand views on YouTube. God bless, yay. And then you read through the comments, and, and those of us in Congress know about half of our comments are bots. A lot of them are Russian bots, which is hysterical. But you read through some of them, they stole my Social Security money. Okay, let's do a math and sort of walk through, because this is really important to understand. The Social Security Trust Fund built up, built up, built up, particularly when the baby boomers, because there was a population bubble that actually built up those tax receipts, had three, four trillion dollars in it. Now that's rolled over. No one stole the money. What happened was you don't kind of just let the cash sit there. So the cash was actually loaned to the Treasury. And the Treasury gives a T-bill, a, a type of Treasury bond. Just like if you walked into your bank and said, I want a US T-bill. Same thing. And twice a year, we pay, the Treasury pays interest. The problem right now, when you hear many of us get behind these microphones and talk about the Social Security Trust Fund getting emptied, is the amount of tax receipts that come in your FICA tax every month don't cover all the checks that are going out. 
So every month they have to take a little bit of one of their T-bills, their tre treasury bills, and hand it to the treasury and say, we need some cash. We need some cash. Give us some cash so we can make this month's Social Security payments. But every time they do that, they use up a little bit of that savings account. And it's that savings account, the trust fund, that is emptied in 2033 or 2034. The Social Security Trust Fund, just like the Transportation Trust Fund, just like the Airline Trust Fund, uh, all the trust funds that are borrowed from, they're paid interest. Um, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong, because, but I think actually last month, because um, Treasury pays interest twice a year to the Social Security Trust Fund, I think last month may have been um, $30 billion, $40 billion. The, the, the mean interest rate is right, it's a little, it's right about market. So for everyone, if you say, they stole my money, it's there. The average couple, the average, will get about a $70,000, $72,000 spiff. So the money they pay into Social Security over their lifetime, the average will get about 70, 72,000. Now understand, that's a crap rate of return. You would, if you had been able, 20 years ago when it was being discussed, been able to take a little sliver of that money and put it in the market, you would have had a ginormous, I love that word, um, larger rate of return. Um, politics of that became toxic. There were lots of campaigns saying, you're trying to privatize. Okay, that world is gone. It's Medicare that actually has the huge problem of for every dollar you put in, you get almost $5 back. Social Security, you get pretty much the money you put in, crappy rate of return, but you get that back. That's the first folklore I wanted to go over. Number two, um, you saw in the comments, why aren't there people there? If this room was full as I'm giving this presentation, we got a problem. Because when you're sitting in this room, we're, this is for voting. This is for debating. This is not necessarily where you do your work. You do your work in your meetings and your subcommittees and your primary committees. So when you see the room empty, this is how it's supposed to be. Now, when you have someone behind them, you know, an idiot like me behind one of these mics, you're probably on a thousand televisions. So a lot of these presentations I do, I'm as much here to talk to staff and try to educate them on what's going on in the math. So that's actually one of the things you look for. Another one, um, I just, I want to say, uh, I, I have this neighbor, wonderful guy, loves screwing with me. About every six weeks, he sends me this text message with this article that's completely fake. David, why do you get 100% of your pension? You got it on the first day. Why do you run again? None of that's true. That's all made up. And, and you're functionally uh, for, I think, 25, 30 years, the pension system we have is pretty much identical to the forest ranger. The only reason I say those things is I believe when you see those sorts of comments in, 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 in posts and other things, it's an attempt to distract. It's an attempt to avoid dealing with, dealing with what's really going on around us. Um, uh, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, House is not in order. Can the House be in order? Will members please take their conversations outside? And, and sorry, I just, the, as you know, the, this, this room has a really weird echo effect. Um, and actually the echo sort of goes away when there's lots of bodies in here, where there's not, it, the sound bounces all over. So one of the points I wanted to go to tonight is what's happening. The economy is actually fairly decent right now. GDP growth is fairly decent. Yet, I, I want to make a point because we did the math just before coming to the floor. So we're functioning, what, five months into the fiscal year? We have added $1,443,000,000,000 billion, $1,243,000,000,000 billion in that five months. Current, my, my current math is uh, right now about every... 123, 25 days at the current borrowing per day, we're adding another trillion dollars. This is in a time where the economy is pretty good. That, that means if my average 
since functionally October 1st is right now we're borrowing about $7.9 billion every day. Got to understand what that ultimately means to us because it's actually been accelerating I think on Friday we set our all-time record. I think we were up to borrowing like $95,000 a second. Almost 100% of that growth is interest, and you're going to see this over and over in the charts, interest in healthcare costs. It's Medicare. It's things that we're not allowed to talk about. They're on autopilot. And if it continues, look, my math says we're heading towards about a 2.6, 2.7 trillion dollar borrow this year in a year where the economy is doing fairly well. But if the current math is today's math held up, you do realize you're broaching three trillion. Now, I, I'm hoping we're going to have a, a really good April tax receipts. But that means right now, if you take where we're at and average it, from the first day of this fiscal year for the five months, we're right now, our math is 2.9 trillion for this year. Borrow. That is substantially higher than CBO predicted six weeks ago. And that's right off the Treasury's website. So let's actually walk through reality and try to understand. My personal theory is we do lots of crazy conversations around here because we're desperate to avoid telling the public, or even ourselves, the truth. Every single dollar you and I, as members of Congress, vote on is borrowed. Every single dollar we vote on is borrowed. And the way we're going this year, every single dollar we vote on is borrowed, plus eight, nine, maybe a trillion dollars of Medicare will be borrowed. And we don't get to vote on that. That's on autopilot. So my point is trying to understand how much. Now, this number is no longer about 73%. We think it's actually approaching 75% will be on mandatory because of the growth of interest. Let me hand that to you. So we made this board a couple days ago, and then the, it popped. So it wasn't 93000 It was almost $95,000 a second. But I didn't want to waste the ink and print a new one. Why do the second? Because it's understandable. I mean, let's be brutally honest. How many of us can see 12 zeros in our head? And, and my fear is that is one of my great sins in trying to communicate my stress about this, is I'm here saying, it's a trillion dollars. No one knows what the hell a trillion dollars is. It's 12 zeros. But when every second we Every second, we borrow more, substantially more than the average wage of Americans. Maybe that hits home. So let's actually sort of walk through what's going on. And then my sarcasm here is going to be my anger at myself, my brothers and sisters here, particularly on the left, but also on the right. We've been debating and fighting over things that don't even qualify as a day's borrowing. We bring this place to its knees. We remove a speaker. We do this and that. And then you realize the amount of dollars being fought over only equal a couple days worth of borrowing. But darn it, it got us on television. I got to raise some money on the internet. And it's that type of false profit that I will argue is our demise. Because if I can get you to fixate on the shiny objects, you're never going to be willing to absorb the truth on how ugly these numbers are. So this is where we're heading towards right now for 2024. Social Security will be our number one spend. Looks like um, it's, it's, it's baseline, though it looks like it's ticking up. We're actually seeing something interesting where a number of retirees asking for benefits is actually ticking a little faster than we expected. But $1,450,000,000. So one trillion four hundred fifty billion number one spend Social Security. Interest, both gross and potentially net, but gross interest now is our second biggest spend. And I just had to redo the math because our math right now looks like for 2024, we're going to cross 1.1 trillion dollars of just interest. 
just interest this year. And I feel, I, I know for many people who are, are forced because you're, you're employed to sit here and listen to an idiot like me talk, you've heard this before, but it doesn't seem to sink in. It's, it's paying $1.1 trillion, is that a Republican or Democrat? It's math. Yet we're not allowed to actually talk about it. Because the hallways in this place are full of people coming to our doors wanting more spending. And you point this out to them and they'll often say, well, um, take it from someone else. I want my money. Well, it's not your money. It's the taxpayer's money. Um, Medicare. And Medicare is rising rapidly. Healthcare costs. And then defense. For all of my brothers and sisters on the left who always say, cut defense, cut defense. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of stupid, but it's the number four expense. It's not number one. How often would you and I go home to our constituents and say, what's the biggest spend in, in government? Oh, it's defense. No, no, defense is now number four. And at the trend line, in the next few years, health care will actually be um, number one, and interest will be number two, and Social Security, believe it or not, will be number three. Um, a right tied to it. It's a, it's a very tight number there. All right, so let's actually walk through the 24 spend because I want to be able to get our heads around this. Social Security, and this was a fascinating number, and we've been trying to also average in what the new appropriations bills, remember, we're just now finishing up our 2024, so we're only five months late, is the net interest. Because the United States does something no other industrialized country does. We play a game with how we describe our borrowing. Oh, that's borrowing from the public. This is borrowing from the trust funds. So if anyone's listening right now and you, want, you question this, go on, what is it, the OECD. Go in and t Google right now, or your favorite search engine, what is the debt to GDP of the United States according to OECD? And you're going to get a number, it's like 144%. Because they don't let the scam artists say, well, you borrowed it from yourself, but you still have to pay it back, and you're going to have to actually borrow money to pay it back while you're paying interest for it. It's a con. We should never allow discussions in this place and not use the terms gross borrowing, because what? Is it magic money? We don't have to pay it back? It's just money we didn't have to go float publicly traded bonds, but we still have to pay it back. And the reason I built this chart is I wanted you to see a line right here. Even the net interest, so the publicly borrowed money, the interest we're going to pay on that, is still the second biggest spend in this government. And I'll say it, and it'll probably just land on death ears. So, Let's actually walk through something that's really uncomfortable and it's gonna tie in. So one of my fixations is how do you stabilize borrowing so that borrowing equals what our economic growth is. I'm gonna show you some charts here later and this is for the, the people that actually care about economics. Here's the growth of the country and here's the debt of the country. If you could ever bring the GDP growth and the debt in line, you created stability. But we have some crazy headwinds. There's also some crazy opportunities happening. Ours. There are good things happening out there. Will Congress be the barrier or the adoption of them? Because right now we are the problem. Um, because we're scared of our own shadows. So if I came to you right now and said, let's come up with a way to stabilize Social Security. Let's stabilize Medicare. It's moral. It's our moral obligation. We made a social contract in this society. Okay? We've got a problem. Um, and it's all something almost no one here ever talks about. We're not having children. The United States fertility rates have collapsed. Um, this number's wrong. It's our, our latest number for last year is not 1.64, it's 1.63. France has a higher fertility rate than the United States. Even when you adjust for their immigration population, they still have a dramatically higher fertility. Most of Western Europe looks like us, and we're worse than a whole bunch of the world. How 
do you and I set public policy so 25 years from now, remember, Social Security is substantially a pay-as-you-go system. Today's workers are functionally paying for today's retirees. The trust fund was the shock absorber. Trust fund is disappearing. But my future generation of workers is going to be smaller. And you're already seeing this in school districts all over America where the number of students they have are shrinking. Are we willing to have the really interesting discussion of, okay, are there things we could do economically to make it so family formation, so there's more children? Um, there's things we could do to help, but almost every country it's tried has not been able to change fertility rates. There, there's, I think in Hungary, I think I saw something that, you know, third child, they buy you a house, fourth child, you get some sort of like prize, and it's barely ticked up their fertility rates. It's a really difficult question, happening all over the industrialized world. So if you can't really change it, do you actually build public policy to deal with it? Do you accept the fact that we're going to have to have a lot more automation? It means capital investment. Are we going to have to find ways to safely adopt artificial intelligence into society so the labor force is maximized in its value and, pro and, and, what, we, and what they earn and productivity? Those are policies we need to work on. You've seen the intellectual capital of the conversations we have on the floor here. How many of them are ready to actually have the reality of, hey, we need to set policy. Is this Republican or Democrat? It's demographics. It's life. And then, and I'm going to bounce through the next two boards because there's a punchline here we need to absorb. Um, this is a little uncomfortable, but this was deaths that are projected to exceed births. And the new math in 15 years you got to understand what a big deal this is. I came behind this microphone a couple years ago, and, and I got some real crap that was sent to my office. And I think at that time I was saying, hey, in 21, 22 years, we're going to have more deaths than births in this country. And then it became 18 years. And then it became 17 years. The new math now is 15 years. In 15 years, the United States will have more deaths than births. The blip you see here is the pandemic. But if you actually look at the line, you can sort of understand, and here's our crossing. Somewhere before, a little before 2040, which is 15 years, we have more deaths than births. Now try to stabilize long-term benefits. There's ways to do it. This Congress right now is mathematically incapable of owning a calculator. But we can, there's ways to do it. Well, we can't even put together a debt and deficit commission to have an honest conversation of what's happening in our society demographically, borrowing-wise, interest rate-wise, because maybe it'll affect the next election. Does anyone actually care about their own pensions, let alone their kids and their grandkids? Because we lie. There's not magic money out there. This inflation cycle didn't prove. Those who believed in modern monetary policy, ta-da, you got 30 months, 36 months of high inflation. If that isn't the ultimate proof that the magic money theory didn't work. And here's the punchline. Social Security actuaries is the green line. They actually had fertility rates going up. These were our baselines. The baselines are also already have continued to show that they're wrong. Be prepared over the next year to see dramatically different numbers coming at us on what our future looks like when financing this society because our next generation is going to be smaller. It's just, it's, it's math. There's ways to make it work. There's ways to make this a society of prosperity. It just requires intellectual capital, something I'm not sure we're ready to do. So let's do a quick run through. This was just the first three months. And I, and, and, and I brought these boards back because I saw some things over the weekend where people were just making numbers up. 
it's not that hard. You can go right to the Treasury's website. You, you have to own a calculator, spend an hour laying it out, put it in. You know how to work Excel. First three months, national debt increased in the first three months. And this was important. This is the 2024 number, $834 billion. Okay, if this is the first three months and it's 834, now I can hope maybe there'll be magic tax receipts, but multiply that times four and you will see what we're projecting. And the part of the punchline is interest continues to grow, and I'm going to show you why some of this is. But in those first three months, we spent $288 billion in interest, and that number is going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger because this year, it's, it's right around, and there's a debate on how much, um, uh, because the Treasury announced that they're going to be financing, rolling some of the debt shorter on the curb. So um, let's say we had a year where we were going to borrow two point, let, let's use a simple number, 2.8 trillion new issuances. But you still have about 7.9 trillion that comes due. It's bonds that have been sold in the past. When they come due, particularly if they were bonds sold three, four, five years ago with very low interest rates, what happens? They're now sold at the newer, higher interest rates. And that's the modeling problem right now. Do you remember one of the first boards I showed you that we expect interest this year to be 1.1 trillion? A lot of that's because the amount of debt, it's coming due, it's coming due. And we stayed very short on the curve instead of what I begged for a few years ago, saying, please, go long in the curve. Go long, because that way at least you locked it in. And if we have what's happening right now, because understand, because Congress doesn't want to be in charge, because you have a White House here that makes crap up, and I can prove that on, on a bunch of the numbers that they published last year, the bond market now runs this country. Hear my words. First time the bond market gets cranky, first time we have an undersubscribed auction, you watch how felt fast this place comes in and we capitulate. Doesn't have to happen. But we are, because we've abdicated our jobs, we basically have made a decision. And this happened actually not that long ago. Go ask some people who were involved in the Clinton administration. Go ask Newt Gingrich. Some of the people around when the bond market hiccuped and the debt situation then was dramatically better than today. This Congress stood attention and did what they needed to do to make the bond market happy. Because if you have a failed bond auction, you want to see society have a really bad day. So let's walk a little more through some of these. <sighs> OK. Total interest costs continue to rise very quickly. And the, look, I'm just trying to make a point here. First four months, if this was 2021, we spent $159 billion in interest. This year, our first four months, 357. Remember my point I was trying to make, interest and health care costs. So we're going to knife each other here over discretionary. And understand, I have some things I would do in discretionary, and I'm going to talk about it. And I promise you, it will be a television ad attacking me, but it's honest. But we don't control this. The thing we can do is if we convince the bond markets we're taking the debt seriously, maybe the interest rates to buy our debt get more efficient, get lower. But the only way the bond market gives us that spiff is because we do our work. And we've proven over and over we're incapable of doing our work. So this was my calculation as of a week and a half ago, and now it's over, gone up again. But we were basically trying to say, what our, my frustration was, last September, we were projecting, hey, interest is only going to be $709 billion. 
And then when we got a little beyond that from October to January, we borrowed 357, and then you start to annualize that, and that's how you're getting closer. Now that's actually going up from that. I'm just trying to make a point. CBO, OMB, a lot of the people around us, they're good people, they're projections. Something's gone horribly wrong in our math and our modeling. We keep being really off the mark. These are dangerous. You know, if, if you're on the left and you care about social welfare policy and the ability to afford that, if you're on the left and, or right and your fixation is economic prosperity and opportunity, we're going to crush both sides. And it's right in front of us. And we do almost nothing to tell the truth about it. Um, I brought some boards about interest rates. I don't know if anyone really cares, but when you start to understand that the differences out there, marketable, unmarketable, unmarketable is um, payments to trust funds and other things. Uh, marketable is you have a bond, you could sell it tomorrow. Um, you have those. Interest rates on outstanding debt. And remember, much of this debt had been sold down here in the trough around one and a half or so was the mean yields. Now it's coming in at well over three. OK, you go, huh? Just understand that difference is you just doubled your interest costs. All right, let's, let's go into something that's uncomfortable. One of the first boards I showed, I showed that every dime a member of Congress votes on is borrowed. OK? So, and, and, and I haven't vetted this. It was actually, I think, in a New York Times article, so God knows that that's accurate that the budget bills that will be coming to us in the next couple of weeks will have around 7,000 plus earmarks in them. Now, the earmarks are only a tiny, tiny fraction of the spending. Okay, except what it is. A really uncomfortable question. Is it actually moral, is it good economics, to borrow money because that's what we do. Everything we're going to vote on here is we're borrowing. To borrow money, to, and many of these are things I like. But is it appropriate to borrow money here and send it to entities that actually have their own taxing authority? Gets better. Turns out we spent a little time looking at municipal bond debt earlier today. Do you know... Cities, states, counties, particularly the highest rated ones, those with like triple A's. And you have to do the tax adjustment because muni bonds have certain tax benefits. Many of them actually have lower interest rates than the United States sovereign debt. So a well-run city with a really good credit rating actually gets float bonds at lower interest rates than we do. That should tell you something. Is it rational moral that we borrow money and send it to entities that have both their own taxing and borrowing authority? And many of those entities actually can borrow money at equal to or better than what we're paying over here. Of non-defense discretionary, about 40% of the money in that non-defense discretionary is actually money we're sending to entities that have their own taxing and borrowing authority. Now, we would all probably get unelected the next day because people would lose their mind saying, we thought that was free money. It's free money, except we're borrowing it and paying interest on it. Those are the types of things, are we capable of having an honest discussion about it? Of course not. But we could try. Here, can I hand you that? All right. A couple more here, and then I'm going to go back to the office and have more coffee. There's often an argument, you can borrow money, but you need, in the long run, to keep it close to the growth of your economy. So how often do you hear people talk about the debt to GDP and the fact the United States now is functionally at 100% of public and borrowed, and if you do total gross, you're well over 140% of debt to GDP. Okay, let's use that entity, and then we adjust 
for inflation. Because remember, a dollar the day President Biden came into office and a dollar today, that dollar today is worth 22, maybe 23 percent less. Um, so you have to do these, all these inflation calculators. But this is actually that fancy, what is the fancy, what's the fancy word? Ketibus, paribus, held equal. Um, trying to point out the increase in national debt, but this is the increase in GDP over 2023. So if this growth here and this debt were right about this green line, you would actually been stable. In a weird way, when you have a politician stand in front of you and say, we're going to pay it off. Really? Did I mention every dime we vote on is now borrowed plus close to a trillion dollars of things we don't even get to vote on, mandatory spending, things like Medicare, is borrowed? It would be nirvana if we could just work our heinies off and get stability, bring down the growth of this debt so it would match our growth rates. And the benefit of that is for the left, if they want to spend more money, great. Grow the economy more, creates more capacity, more, more tax receipts, more borrowing capacity. For those of us who want to cut, we actually know the number we're working towards. That's how we would do it if we'd put on our economist hat. Same concept, just a little bit differently done. Increase in national debt outpaced growth in the economy by more than one trillion over the past year. And that's what that bond market's going to be looking at. It's that debt to GDP and when does it hit stress? When does a spike in interest rates? When does a recession? When does a pandemic? When does a war make it so your likelihood to be paid back your interest in your principal? And understand, when the United States actually has, and dear God, please don't let it ever happen, that moment of stress, that failed auction, we put the entire world into a depression. The entire world, let alone your pension, let alone my kids' future, depends on us getting our act together here. So the last chart, and this one is a little difficult because there's some anomalies in the numbers, but we didn't have time to fix it. So on occasion, we'll go all the way back to um, 2000. Now remember, 2000 had an unusual tax collection year because the year or two before that, there were massive capital gains because of the dot-com bubble. So it, the number is always distorted. Um, but at that year, we collected 20% of GDP in taxes. Okay, long run average has been about 17.8. Um, so let's actually go to 2023. That year we collected 16.5% of GDP in taxes. We still had some of the legacy of COVID and some other things. But the other part of this chart, I'm trying to show you the hierarchy of spending. You know, Social Security, where Medicare, Defense, others. And you start to see this spending up here, when you start seeing that green, well, the green is nothing but interest. And our problem is, even with the projections, which I hope are right, that long run over the next eight years or so, we start getting up close to 18% of the economy in tax receipts. Okay, great. The gap continues to still widen. And most of that widening is our projection of the benefits we've promised our brothers and sisters who get older. Our, what is it, 67 million of us who are baby boomers. Our health care benefits, the interest we owe, and then back to the point earlier. What do these numbers look like in 2033, 2034, when the Social Security Trust Fund is empty? Will the policy be we're going to raise taxes? OK, except I've already done the presentation multiple times on the floor where I brought in the economic data from both liberal groups and other groups that showed even tax maximization. This is the punchline, please understand. The tax maximization 
when you do the economic effects, you get about a point and a half of GDP. So you take people $400,000 and tax maximize everything for them. Tax maximize their income tax, their capital gains tax, their estate tax. You just do it all. You get about a point and a half of GDP. Yay! And then over here, for those of us who want to cut things, you take everything that's been discussed in discretionary, the debate we've had in this place for the last several months, and it's a fraction of a fraction of a percent. It's, it's, it's not even a rounding error. So you'd have to change programs, change spending, adopt technology, make people healthier. Understand, the single biggest thing you could do to bring down borrowing over the next decade, take on things like diabetes. 33% of all healthcare spending. And it would be moral, and is that Republican or Democrat? It's just the right thing to do. How many brilliant discussions have you seen behind these microphones of saying we're actually looking for real solutions? No, we're too busy knifing each other. So for those of us, I can find about a point and a half point of GDP to cut. Okay, so I got a point and a half over here. Let's say it's a point and a half over here and this end. This year so far, we're borrowing 9.6% of the entire economy. 9.6 of all GDP, and all the solutions are a fraction of that. Yet the left's going to come behind the microphone and say, we don't tax rich people enough. And the right's going to come in saying, it's foreign aid and spending. Well, foreign aid equals like seven, eight days, maybe nine days of borrowing. Every dime of it. Why can't we just tell the truth? Madam Speaker Pro Tem, every dime of borrowing from today through the next 30 years is demographics. And maybe telling the truth gets me unelected, but damn it, it's worth telling the truth. It's demographics. It's interest on what's been borrowed and what's to be borrowed. It's health care, particularly Medicare. And if eight, nine years from now when the Social Security Trust Fund is emptied, and remember, the math is the very first year of the shortfall is $616 billion. How do we backfill that? If you try to backfill it through taxes, fine. Uh, you've got to accept the economic effects of how much you just slowed down the economy and how you slowed down other tax receipts. Do you do it through borrowing? Well, then it explodes. And that's how you see some projections that 30 years from now, U.S. sovereign debt will be $130 trillion. And between now and then, how many people around the world, how many people in this country are going to be willing to buy our debt? Do our work, take it seriously, put together the Debt and Deficit Commission, demonstrate to the people who want to save and buy U.S. debt that we're taking paying them back seriously. Take it seriously that my, I have very young kids, they deserve a future, but also make it so that people who want to enjoy their retirement understand the stability, retirement security. We all say it, and almost none of us are willing to actually do the work for it. Madam Speaker Pro Tem, with that, I'm going to go have some more coffee and yield back. The gentleman yields back.